if the decent gods of the theater want to find the precious plays for the post-60s American woman's time capsule, I know the ones I'd trust. Welcome to Women in Theater. I'm Linda Weiner, theater critic and arts columnist of Newsday. And our guest today is Wendy Wasserstein, a genuine pioneer who has been writing characters smart enough to observe our social upheaval as we have lived it, and incidentally, changed the way I think about theater forever. Scared? Scared? No. Yes. True. Absolutely true. You've probably heard this story many times, but there I was, a critic in Chicago, and um, had been a theater critic for quite a long time, and Uncommon Women and Others, not even in the Meryl Streep, right. um, Smoosey Kurtz mm -hmm. version, but some at some little theater that David Mamet used to use. They had this play by this woman I'd never heard of. And uh, I sat there during that play and thought, oh my God, I've been doing this all these years and I'd never realized that I have never seen a play about people who could be my friends. I never realized that our lives were material, were the stuff of theater. No one had done it. Mm -hmm. And it was shocking to me. <laughs> you know, good, bad, good, right. good. Right. But the point that here is a woman writing about my contemporaries in ways that we speak, mm -hmm. and it's a real play. Right. So I always wanted to thank you for that. And I think that basically what happens is that people have no idea how recently that was. I think that's true, Linda. I really think that's true. Um, I remembered your review, actually. I was in <laughs> Chicago at the time, and it was at the St. Nicholas Theater, and Mike Nussbaum directed that production. Uh, and I, re I remember the whole thing really clearly. And I remember reading your review, and I thought, oh my god, this is being reviewed by a woman. So you might not have thought about there would be women on stage. I didn't think of the thought that a woman would be reviewing this and understand it from that point of view didn't occur to me either. So there was a reciprocal thing was yeah. going on then. Boy, should it not matter, you know? <laughs> should, should we not have to say these words? But it's true. But it's true. It there are true. just... I go to plays where women are sitting around talking and a lot of male critics think that nothing's going on. Right. It doesn't have to be that way, but there tends to be a, an impatience with, uh, with hearing pe women sit around talk as opposed to, you know, the guys. You know, it's interesting. When I, I was at Yale Drama School with Chris Durang, who's my great friend, and, and uh, we used to go to a lot of movies that, during that time instead of writing plays. Chris and I <laughs> went to the, Le the Yale Law School Film Society, and we went to see, like, Stage Door, The Women. And if you go back and you look at movies from the 30s, 40s, they're stylized, but the writings of Edna Ferber, Anita Luce, I disagree with Claire Booth Luce, Paula, but there were roles for, for intelligent, witty women. They weren't, they were different because like a Philip Barry play, it was sort of a class thing and you thought, I, I, I don't know these women and the no. women, they're not like the girl next but door. But the dresses Winnetka, are nice. But the right. dresses are nice. But, th but they were women and some of the women in stage door say, Lucille Ball's part, she was a working girl, you know. But I think very much I thought, I want to do this. I want to put people I know on stage, smart, witty. And was it really from the movies? Because there were, there were no contemporary models. I think it was from the movies. It was from growing up going to plays. It was literally my parents used to take me to the plays. I grew up going to the June Taylor School of the Dance <laughs> on 56 and Broadway, and then they'd take me to see plays. And I did used to think, where are the girls? There weren't any girls that I particularly identified with. I didn't know who these people were. I thought they were the people who are in plays. Yes, they are. <laughs> I never had any idea that, that <laughs> there weren't women, or that the women didn't sound like Right. Didn't sound true. Uh huh. Uh, and when you wrote Uncommon Women and Others, um, and that was like 77, 78. Yeah, 78. And after that, um, 
I'm going to I'm going to skip one just because sure. the the big one for me again uh, was the Heidi Chronicles. Right. Right. And that was eighty eight nine. Yeah, eighty eight. And you won yeah. Pulitzer Prize for that. And it went to Broadway. It started mm -hmm. at Playwrights Horizons with Andre right. Bishop, right. and um, who has been a part of, right. you know, your your own I, your own producer. Yes. So great to have your own producer <laughs> yes. in your bag, right? right. And um, you were the first woman playwright to win a Tony Award. I was. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Now, how how bizarre. Is that? Is that? There was one, the couple, the Hackett's, won for their adaptation of The Diary of Anne Frank. But okay. yes, 1989, first woman to win a Tony Award. What's amazing of that is how recent that is. Really recent. Um, it's a, a startling uh, fact, I think. I mean, it's changed since then. Yes, Nina Risa won for art. Um, but still, uh, Suzanne Laurie Parks was nominated, uh, but I still find it a, a startling thing. Yeah. I, in, in Heidi Chronicles, Heidi is an mm -hmm. uh, art history major, Yes. but she does join a movement, Women in Art, which mm -hmm. every time I walk in here, I think <laughs> I should have one of those placards from the Heidi Chronicles that says, Women in <laughs> Theater, Women right. in Theater. That's right. Um, and in a very important scene, she she begins. She's trying to give a lecture on women. Where are we mm -hmm. going? Right, right. And sort of cracks up. Right. Yes. And I mean, do you have women? Where are we going? Crack ups like twice a week. Sometimes. Uh, some, <laughs> depends. I literally have them when sometimes I'm asked to speak, and I think that you think I know. <laughs> it's just really. I don't You're know. You're my time capsule. You have to know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I don't know. You know, it's funny. I, I've been talking to friends recently a lot about the state of women and women. Where are we going and what is the issue? And then the thing that struck me most was I was in my elevator and a woman roughly my age, let's just say I graduated college in 1971. Let's just say you're younger than I am. Yes, yeah, so let's honey it. <laughs> and I skip, so you know. Uh, 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 but whoa. but uh, this woman said to me, are you writing? And I said, oh, you know, and she said, well, I hope you are because we're becoming invisible. And I thought, oh my God, that is so sad and had a ring of truth to it. Uh, and it, it just really uh, struck me so that when you think, when and where are we going, when there isn't even the voice of protest, where are we going, it's even scarier. Mm -hmm. The issue becomes more important. Which, um, clearly, if someone's watching the show, they already know that you don't write doctrinaire plays. Right, <laughs> right. Uh, but, but the, I guess what I learned from you, from the start, was that that who decides whose stories are going to be told? I I think that's really legitimate. When I wrote my play, the, uh, the Sisters Rosenzweig, which is about three sisters, the oldest fifty-four, and a man walks into a room and falls in love with her, and that was my idea. And I thought, this is interesting. I'm going to write a boulevard well-structured comedy, you know, Jane Alexander is going to wander around in a tennis outfit and you laugh, you cry, you go home. But I thought on some level this is a political act because if you went to, say, Hollywood and said, I have an idea, a 50, you know, a man's going to walk into a room and fall in love with a 54-year-old woman, they'd say, no, it's not going to happen. We can't sell that. And so what you get to do as a playwright is say, I, this is my idea. I believe this is possible, true, actable, and theatrical. I'm going to do this, which is interesting. So you're taking regular people's lives, even privileged people's lives, and in fact, it is a political thing to write about them. Um, yeah. And um, Andre Bishop, the producer mm -hmm. at Lincoln Center who started right. with you at Playwrights Horizon, said, um, Wendy Weiss writes plays of ideas, but she writes them as comedies. 
And do you think sometimes that because they are comedies and or tragic comedies, that, that people sometimes miss that they are players of ideas? Probably. But, you know, I think one could sit and think, oh, you know, they, they didn't understand what I was getting at. They didn't blah, blah, blah. Then you think, Wendy, darling, you're lucky. It's up and running. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, but I think that is true. I think that with comedy, and especially well-crafted comedy, comedy that works where people are laughing, there is a tendency to think, oh, this is easy. This isn't, quote, edgy. This isn't, you know, difficult and gritty and messy. And, um, I, you know, I'm somebody who's very interested in craft. I'm very, very interested in making something work. And I'm very interested in capturing a character, in a sense, so that it starts with an idea and even a play about ideology and then to capture the character within, within that. Yeah. Oh, I guess we may as well bring up my, my heartbreak. <laughs> we'll just yes. do my heartbreak. My yes. personal heartbreak is, um, is the play American, An American Daughter, yeah. which to my mind is the, the evolution from, the, the, the wonderful evolution from Uncommon Women mm -hmm. to Heidi Chronicles to An, Ameri to an American Daughter where, mm -hmm. where women now are out as doing political acts. Right. This is a... Uh, a, and it opened first on Broadway. It didn't open yes, off-Broadway this time. Yes, opened on Broadway, yeah. And uh, it, about a, woman, a doctor who's um, just been appointed a Surgeon General. Right, right. And then the press and the spin doctors go to town on her. Right. And pretty soon she's wearing headbands and, <laughs> um, and, and defending right. her cookie recipes. Right. And, uh, for me, this was this. You know, if Sister Rosenzweig was your Chekhov right. play, this right. it, this is Shaw. Uh -huh. You know, this is play about ideas, just right. so beautifully made into a comedy. Right. Again, right. a political right. comedy. Right. And um, I mean, talk about time time <coughs> capsules. As far as I'm concerned, this play will be done again in 10 years and everyone will say, oh my God, that was such an amazing play. But it, it was, it must have been crushing. It was crushing. That play was, you know, not just mixed, was sort of dismissed. Yeah. And when there was one place I read, they said, oh, you know, she slipped on a banana peel this year. And the play was, I thought, and it was interesting because there were many, there was you, Interestingly enough, Martha Stewart came to the opening night of that play, came up to me and said, you got it. This is a wonderful play. And then it was given what's happened to her. <laughs> I was like, you know. But, uh, and there, Molly Smith just did that play at the arena stage in a very good production. Sometimes when you write about women, people say, oh, we know this already. There's nothing new here. And then you think, I can't believe that you're just going to dismiss all, first of all, women, we know this already. And then this is about specific people. Uh, one of the joys of that play, and it's the heartbreak, was that Lynn Figton won the Tony Award for it. And Lynn Figton passed away yeah. last year. Yeah. So at least as a record, because the play was done for television. And, she's, is, and she was in the, she and was in she it, yeah. was in that. So yeah. there's, there's Lynn's performance as the African-American Jewish oncologist. So. <laughs> who, who goes to the, to the, the festival of regrets and throws, and throws, bread, her, throws bread, bread in the water. Yeah. 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 Now, festival of regrets, the Jewish festival of regrets also comes up in a, in an opera libretto you've been working on. Yes. So, it seems to me that you've done, you're not, you're doing fewer plays right now and sort of branching out on more collaborative things. I have been branching out. I, I did an opera with Deborah Drutel, The Festival of Regrets. I've written uh, a musical based on my children's play, Pamela's First Musical with Cy Coleman, that uh, Graziella Danielle is going to direct. And at Yale soon, a at workshop? Yale, I think, yeah. a workshop at Yale. And actually, I've just written two one-act plays that we're going to read at, at Lincoln Center. Wow. 
So, so that's good. That's good. Yeah. Now, there's another opera called Best Friends. Yes. That's now, I thought only women, a woman librettist <laughs> and, and a woman composer can write, can think, let's write an opera called Best Friends and see if anybody's going to ever produce it's, that. It's true. Best Friends is really funny. It's, uh, in a way, an updated version of those 30s, 40s movies. Because just hanging around the opera world, I thought there were all these women. Why isn't there an all-female opera? So I wrote this female opera with a male chorus. <laughs> and it's about two best friends, and one of them has the perfect life. And the other is an experimental opera star who was doing her Hannah Arendt one-woman show. <laughs> it's just sort of funny. And the composer just for, to, is the same composer as, um, yeah, as, as the festival, as the festival of regrets. Of, yeah, yeah. regrets. Deborah Dratel. Yes. Dratel. Yes. How I pronounce it? Uh -huh. Okay. Um, now, when you were growing up, you um, you were a history major. I was a history major. You were a history major. Mount Hollyhock, which of yeah. course is the setting for Uncommon Women right, and Others. Right, right. But there was a time there when you were thinking you were going to go be an intern at a um, con con Congress for Congress. Oh, uh, yes, it. absolutely. And instead you went and took a playwriting class? Yes, I was going to... How did these things happen? I, it's just you know, I was going to be an intern in Congress. I was going to the library. I kept reading the Congressional Digest and falling asleep. And a friend of mine said, why are you doing this, Wendy? We can go to Smith and take playwriting and then go shopping. And I thought, you know, <laughs> this is a good, you're making sense to me. So I was very lucky. I had a wonderful playwriting teacher when I was in college. So. Um, he, he said that Wendy's a woman who thinks behind her face. Yeah, which yeah. I think is really useful. It's I mean, I started funny. thinking, oh, yeah, she's thinking behind her face. Right? Yes. Yeah. Um, at the um, at at Yale, you went mm -hmm. on to Yale, mm -hmm. and with uh, all the all the good people, right? But no right. other women playwrights. Well, they, I mean, there were other women playwrights there, but certainly they weren't particularly doing okay. our work. But, it, or but no, but y your year was Meryl Streep and Durang Ma and uh, Meryl was a year ahead of me, okay. and Christopher was two years ahead of me. And in my class, there was one African American playwright, Sharon Stockard Martin. Um, but certainly the school was not doing many plays by women, I can assure you. <laughs> you said that the uh, point of view there was that the pain in the world is men's pain. Yes, definitely. And definitely. Um, when Uncommon Women was done at Yale, uh, we, there was an after play discussion and somebody raised their hand and said, I can't get into this, it's about girls. And I, I said, I went to Mount Holyoke, I mean, I went to a women's college, I thought, what are you talking about? So I said, well, you know, I spent my life getting into Lawrence of Arabia and Robin Hood, so why don't you try it? I just couldn't imagine that. So. Um, when, um there was one point at the end of Heidi Chronicles that was quite controversial because we were all with you from her student days through her, uh, right. you know, e everything in terms of, of the growth of feminism and her strength <laughs> and the wonderful ways that mm -hmm. you use 60s right. music and everything. You, uh, this was the, bil the, big, the big chill play that right. actually got it right. right. And then at the end, Heidi adopts a baby and that's the happy ending. Mm -hmm. And and uh, this was not a popular ending. No, no, it wasn't at all. Uh, there were many people who who thought, oh, I was saying for a woman to be happy, she had to have a baby. What was I saying? I really wasn't saying for her to be happy, she had to have a baby. What I was saying is, this is her story. She this was the choice that she made. Yeah, but we were, she was, <coughs> she was us. She, yes, know, so, that's true. So we got nervous. Now, why is I, why does she have to have this baby? And um, especially in uh, Isn't It Romantic when Janie, mm. Janie Ann saying the trick is not to get frightened. There's nothing wrong with being alone. Mm. And all the plays are about, you know, your friends are your family. It's okay. Right. And childlessness is a problem, but it's okay. Right. And then there's there's Heidi, you know, adopting a baby, and that's the happy ending. And uh, I think even my reviews, I you mm. know, I forgave you for it because <laughs> the rest of it was so good that right. I forgave you for right. it. 
Well, now you have, you, you want to say something about Lucy Jane? Oh, actually, I have a baby. <laughs> oh, oh. So, by the way. Yeah, by the way, I have a baby. So, yes, many times in my plays, they've often foreshadowed things. <laughs> um, and, um, yeah, my, my girl is four years old. And uh, she's a student, and she's at nursery school, and she's wonderful. Her first word was cat. I like her first I word that. was cat. Her second word was book, and then she said mama. <laughs> so, but basically, she likes to pretend she's a cat. She has recently started putting on little shows in her room. Uh oh. So I know, uh -oh. I know. And then I take out my first body book and say, look, Lucy Jane, this is a liver. Isn't it interesting? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, what, I'm trying, Linda. I know. <laughs> I mean, wasn't it, you know, you're deciding, do I become a doctor or do I marry a doctor? Yes, that's right. Right, right. right. So, right. do we, we become lawyers or do we marry lawyers? And in fact, we couldn't really do both. No, we could no. This is hard, I, hard for these characters in there's usually one character in your play that, despite all the generosity of spirit, you're really tough on some neocon young woman right. who doesn't get it. Right. You know, right. Who, who sort of looks it, sorry. Right. For, right. For the fact that. Right. You know, but we, there wasn't a real choice, right? I mean, mm -hmm. if you wanted to have a career, you wanted, you had to have a career. You had to have a. I don't. I mean, certainly in my life, when you know, like I wrote the Heidi Chronicles and stuff. I was obsessed with my work. I couldn't actually, now I really know what it takes to raise a child. I couldn't have done it. I just couldn't have. Uh, whether it was time-wise or just in terms of my own obsession, I know what interested me. Um, I'm still very interested in writing plays. And the one thing about writing plays and having a child is, if you have a child late in life and you've been single a long time, what you miss is being alone. And if your job is that you have to be alone and be in touch with yourself, it's a very nice job to have. <laughs> so you don't lose yourself. So do you leave home? I know you used to like to write in hotels. Yeah, I write in libraries. I write in, you know, all, all sorts of places. Yeah, I do. I can't write at home. I never could. Yeah. You also are a, are a, a many, many times published uh, essayist. Yes. Which yeah. um, sort of allowed the world to grow up with you. you know? yes. <laughs> yes. Do you ever regret that? I mean, you know, you've really shared so much that people think they know you, right? I know. It's funny. I thought recently of, you know, really writing about what it's like to be a mother and, you know, the parents and the birthday part, the, just and the, you know, four o'clock in the morning. And then I thought, Wendy, now this isn't just your life. This is somebody else's life. You can't do this. Oh. So. Well, you wrote about your mother. You, you wrote about Lola. Yes, well, always. She deserves it. She, <laughs> <laughs> she's still dancing and wearing leather, Lola's leather pants. Lola's still dancing. Wow. Lola still goes to the Broadway Dance Center and dances. I mean, she was obviously and has been such great copy for you. Did she really say at the party in, uh, for Sisters Rosenzweig at Tavern on the Green, did she really look around and say, isn't this wonderful? Too bad it's not Wendy's wedding? She did. To Ann Catania, she said this. I actually have a commission from Lincoln Center to write the Lola play. I, my feeling is the real play is the Lola play. <laughs> so I, uh, if I could just channel her, that's the thing. <laughs> yeah. It's really, it's, it's, does she know she's funny? She must. I think she does. I mean, yeah. this is yeah. this is her thing. This is her thing. This is yeah. her thing with yeah. you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Anne Catania, you mentioned um, mm -hmm. a uh, um, dramaturg, mm -hmm. a literary agent, a literary manager who mm -hmm. um, you've worked with for years, which I didn't know then. Yeah. Who I cut out something that she said a while ago, mm -hmm. which um, was that theaters used to, the, if there were fifty regional theaters, there'd be one new play in 50 regional theaters. Mm -hmm. And now there's 50 regional theaters and they all do the same play. Yes, yes. What's happening? I think, you know, it has to do with budgetary things. I also, but I really think what has to happen is there has to be more uh, creative producing. There has to be people's, I mean, uh, one of the great things that Dan Sullivan did when he was 
running the Seattle Rep was he started this new plays workshop. That's where Heidi was done. Mm -hmm. Heidi was done there the same year Richard Greenther did Eastern Standard. And there was a whole slew of plays that came out of this artistic director saying, I want to do this. And that's not happening now. Uh, it's not happening as much. I know uh -huh. Molly Smith at the arena has a directive mm -hmm. to do new plays. Emily Mann at the McCarter does. And I think this it's got to happen more and more, or the regional system will become like the Broadway system. Yeah. And there used to be, I remember around with you and, and there were Beth Henley and Marsha Norman and, you know, we were all getting hor horribly boring writing about, look at the women playwrights, right, you know, right. we'd get the women playwrights. Right. But now I look back, it was a golden age, considering, because right. there are so few right. now. Right. What I, happened? I don't know. I mean, certainly if you go to the Yale School of Drama or Juilliard that uh, Chris and Marsha run, there are wonderful women playwrights at these schools Chris Durang now. and Marsha Norman, yeah. yes. Yeah. So I think it, they're out there. It's the question is of being produced, not just in workshops. Mm -hmm. A lot of theater, you know, becomes a lot like progressive school, and we're going to let you express yourself and, you know, find the work. And that's fine. But playwrights deserve to make a living, and their plays deserve to get done, I think. We're almost out of time, okay. so I want to ask one question sure. that, that may not be answerable, but sure. as a woman, if you could snap your fingers right now and change one thing for women in the theater. <sighs> mm. uh, what I wish was that there wasn't a separate slot for women in the theater. I wish that every single regional theater wouldn't say, we're going to do plays, and then we'll have our African-American slot, and then we'll have our women's slot. We are playwrights. You can do a whole season of women plays and not call it our women's season. They're plays. You can do a whole season of African-American women playwrights. Those are, we are playwrights. And it, it, to be treated completely equally would be a very nice thing, and it's about time. That's oh. what I would say. Boy, is it about time. Yeah. <laughs> thank, you, thank you, Wendy Wasserstein. It's been such a pleasure. Oh, Linda, my pleasure always. And thank you for being here. On behalf of the League of Professional Theater Women, I'm Linda Weiner, and this has been Women in Theater.